Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining my presentation. I'm Tilman Kneiting, based at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies and Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. My talk is on isotonic distributional regression for IDR. Subtitle is Leveraging Monotonicity Uniquely So. This is joint work with Alexander Henzi and Johanna Ziegel at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And indeed, the bulk of the work, all of the implementation is due to Alexander and Johanna. In fact, the talk and the underlying preprint is based on Alexander's master thesis under the supervision of Johanna Eckbern University in Switzerland. As you will see, we will begin with quite a bit of, well, we will begin with the history regression. I will then turn to theory for IDR and methodology, computing, and close with an application to weather forecasting, which is in the context of the Waves to Weber Consortium at KIT. So here is a, yeah, a more formal preview of what I'm going to show in the next 50 minutes or so. Again, we will start with a historical review, a pictorial review of regression. I will then turn to the mathematical background. Some of the mathematics is classical, such as the theory of partial orders, partially ordered sets, posets, very classical, various notions of calibration and proper scoring rules are uh, uh, perhaps not so classic, and I will spend more time on introducing them. Then I will turn to the theory, methodology, and computing for IDR before closing the case study on numerical error prediction on precipitation forecasts on statistically post-processed precipitation forecasts and a discussion. So, what is regression? Regression originates from what is arguably the most notorious priority dispute in the history of mathematics and statistics between the two colleagues pictured here, Carl Friedrich Gauss and Audrey Marie Le Chantre. And they had a decade long bitter argument about the priority over a method of least squares, which of course is a workhorse of modern statistics and indeed the workhorse, a workhorse of applied mathematics and perhaps it's fair to say uh, science and technology in general. Steve Stickler, a preeminent historian of statistics, he wrote in 1981, summarized the dispute in that Gauss probably possessed the method well before Le Chantre, but was unsuccessful in communicating it to his contemporaries. Uh, this brings me out to the hope that I will be successful in communicating IDR uh, to you today, uh, but you be, you be the judge on it. Okay, so the origins of regression go back to Gauss and Le Chantre. What do we think today? It's always, well, not always, but uh, often illuminating to look at Wikipedia at a entry for regression at Wikipedia, which notes that commonly regression analysis estimates a conditional expectation, less commonly the focus is on a quantile of a conditional distribution. In all cases, a function of the independent variables called the regression function is to be estimated. Moving on, that it is also of interest to characterize the variation of a dependent variable around the prediction of a regression function in a probability distribution. So here, here we already see a note on distributional 
a hint at distributional regression. And this is much more nicely formulated in a recent JRSSP paper by Hartmann, Kneip, and Bühlmann, who argue forcefully in 2014 that the ultimate goal of regression analysis is to obtain information about a conditional distribution of a response given a set of explanatory variables. This, in fact, is my preferred terminology. I like the terminology of a response variable in the underlying set of covariates or explanatory variables. This is much clearer, in my opinion, uh, when talking about dependent and independent variables. So let's talk about the response and explanatory variables. So in a nutshell, in distributional, distributional regression, we use training data consisting of pairs, x sub i, y sub i. So we have a set of n training data. n is the size of the training data set. Now y is the response variable. And here in this presentation, we assume that the response is real valued. And x sub i is the respective set of explanatory variables or covariates. And these explanatory variables lie in some abstract space x, of course, in any given x, in any given context, in any given application, x does not remain abstract. x becomes uh, could be a subset of Rp. It could be a space of images. It could be whatever, as long as we can put a partial order. On this set. And this is exactly what, in a nutshell, IDR, isotonic distributional regression, is about. It uses monotonicity relations within a covariate space to find non parametric conditional distributions. And if you think that monotonicity is a strong assumption, then perhaps think again. Uh, actually, this is something that occurred to me only after, uh, well, after doing research on IDR for a long time. Actually, standard plain vanilla linear regression assumes a monotone relationship. A linear relationship is monotone. Of course, we don't need to care about signs. We can always use a covariate with a minus sign in front of it. So, indeed, an assumption of monotonicity, uh, this is even part of plain vanilla linear regression. Oops, sorry, let me go back uh, to Okay, so uh, here I am back to full screen mode. Uh, let me give you, essentially, this is a two-minute summary of a talk in pictures. This is a standard setting. For regression, we have a bivariate time cloud. We said that the response y is real valued, but here the covariate x is real valued as well. So, a simple possible setting we are interested in a regression function for y in dependence on the covariate x. This is the plain vanilla ordinary least squares. Regression line. We immediately soon see two issues here. The first is, rather obviously, there is heteroscedasticity in the data. Second is, the data, well, the responses appear to be non negative. There is not a single negative value of y sub i, but really squares for the regression line, well, it crosses y equals to zero line. The other major problem is that the least squares line alone does not make any statements about uncertainty. But of course, we can yeah, put the usual, for example, 80% prediction interval around it. We do see, well, a uh, homoscedastic model indeed appears very problematic and the uh, yeah, 
the prediction intervals go even further into the negative. Of course. Now this is not very satisfactory. As an alternative, we could fit an L1 regression line rather than the L2 regression line. And of course, we all know that the L1 regression line this corresponds to median regression. In L1 regression, the line corresponds to the median of the associated conditional predictive distribution. You now want to assess uncertainty, well, then we could repeat the process. We could look at quantile regressions at level 0 0.05, this is the median line, but also at levels 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0.9. Now this looks a lot more attractive in that we have addressed heteroscedasticity. However, regression lines still go below zero. So let's zoom in here. So we do go below zero, <clears throat> despite the data being non negative. And even worse, there's quantile crossing. This is the well-known problem of quantile crossing. If we do independent linear quantile regressions at distinct levels. So here we're back to linear quantile regression and trying to remedy this problem. An obvious approach is to use non-parametric methods. For example, standard non-parametric isotonic mean L2 regression. Now this clearly addresses non-negativity of a response variable. And also the fit generally is more appropriate than under linear models. We can do the same thing <coughs> under L1 loss for median regression. And now the same idea applies. We can do this not only at the 0.5 level, at the median level, but we can do this at a level of 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. Now this doesn't look bad. We've addressed a problem of non-negativity. We've addressed heteroscedasticity. And we've have an, <clears throat> we almost have probabilistic forecasts. Distribute, no, not forecasts. Uh, probabilistic, this can be used for forecasts. Uh, we have a distributional regression function at least at the five levels given here. But then, of course, we can repeat at just every level between zero and one, we can repeat the non-parametric quantile isotonic quantile regression. And this, indeed, this is IDR. IDR performs non-parametric quantile regression at every level using the classical PAV pool adjacent violators algorithm. And as you will see later on, everything fits together perfectly. We don't have any quantile crossing. Everything is perfectly valid from a mathematical perspective. And indeed, the solution that we see here, this is the optimal solution, solution with respect to a huge class of loss functions that is considered in practice for regression and in probabilistic forecasting. And the amazing, the most amazing fact to me is that we have simultaneous optimality with respect to every single loss function within a very big and very, yeah, very comprehensive class of loss functions that is of great importance in practice. So this is IDR in a nutshell, a graphical portrayal, and it is getting time to, uh, yeah, to look at the details. So again, setting is that the isotonic distribution regression with this training data of this form. In our example, the explanatory variables of covariates were real-valued, but from now on, they will be in a general 
covariant space X, and IDR takes advantage of known or assumed monotonicity relations between the covariates and the real valued outcome. And I have again and again talked about forecasting or prediction in lieu of regression. And this is because for primary uses of IDR line prediction and forecasting, uh, we know the covariates X, but we do not know the outcome Y yet. So let's get at the mathematical details. And the full understanding relies on a number of mathematical concepts and developments that I will review now, namely calibration and sharpness, proper scoring rules, and partial authors. So let's turn to the mathematical background, starting with calibration and sharpness. The very first question is, if you want to come up with conditional distribution functions, rather than uh, just a conditional mean or a conditional quantile, we are facing unprecedented challenges. In that the regression functions now are probability measures. We have conditional predictive distributions in the form of probability measures or equivalently cumulative distribution functions, CDFs. However, the outcomes, the training data and the test data, the real numbers, not probability distributions. So to evaluate, to assess how well we do, we need to compare apples and oranges. And the guiding principle in judging the success of distributional regression methods is to maximize the sharpness of a conditional predictive distributions subject to calibration. Now, calibration refers to a statistical compatibility between the conditional predictive CDFs and the outcomes. And the key principle is that the outcomes ought to be indistinguishable from random draws from the conditional predictive CDFs. If our regression function is a probability distribution, then the only valid interpretation is that the outcome is a random outcome drawn from exactly that predictive, conditional predictive distribution. And this is yeah, what can be formalized and what has been formalized over the past few years in a trend of literature, both in statistics and in machine learning. This is what we refer to as calibration. Sharpness simply refers to a concentration of a conditional predictive distributions. The more concentrated, the better. If you have prediction intervals, then subject to calibration, the more concentrated, the shorter the prediction intervals, the better always under the constraint of calibration. So let's formalize everything and we consider a probability space, omega AQ, usual identifications. Members of a sample space omega are tuples of the following form. The random vector X takes values in the covariate space. So these are the explanatory variables or covariates. F sub X corresponds to our conditional predictive distribution or regression function for Y given X. We are interested in distributional regression. So this is a PDF cumulative distribution function. And in a setting, we view it as a CDF valued random quantity. Y is the real valued outcome. And finally, V, this is a purely technical device. Uh, v is uniform on the unit interval 0, 1, and independent of everything else. This is simply a randomization device. And in this theoretical setting, the CDF valued regression function F sub X is said to be ideal if it is the true conditional distribution of Y given X. Of course, almost truly, uh, when is the technicality only. We could issue any other F sub X. It doesn't have to be ideal. 
and of course in practice it needs to be estimated anyway so in practice it will not be exactly ideal but this is what we are looking for if a forecast is ideal then of course it embodies it uh, yeah it honors all the information available in the covariate x and it's all sorts of optimality properties Okay, now let's turn to notions of calibration. And we let f sub x be a CDF value, regression function. And now we define the associated probability integral transformer PIT. We call it set. And set is simply the predictive, the conditional distribution, f sub x, evaluated at the observation. Now, if f sub x is continuous, this term here simply disappears and is nothing but the value of a predictive CDF evaluated at the observation, a number between 0 and 1, of course. But this definition here is more general to allow for discontinuous f sub x. And the definition is in this way. This actually is a, yeah, it's a, it's a probability 101 exercise. If f sub x is ideal, then z is ideal for y, then z is uniformly distributed. And actually, we make this a definition. We say that f sub x is probabilistically calibrated if a PIT set has a uniform distribution on 0, 1. Of course, ideal regression functions are probabilistic probabilistically calibrated, and ideal regression functions also are threshold calibrated in the sense in here. And yeah, this is already a simple theorem. An ideal regression function is both probabilistic calibrated and threshold calibrated, uh, yeah, which is a justification for our goal to seek regression functions that satisfy these properties. In practice, how can we assess calibration? There is a standard procedure. Again, note that a probabilistically calibrated regression function as a uniform PIT. So in practice, we composite PIT values over cases and then plot the respective histogram. And of course, we are happy if the histogram is uniform. But in practice, it often is U-shaped and that indicates under this first forecast, these prediction intervals that are too narrow on average. And if you have a skewed PIT histogram, something that is going down or going up, that is indicative of biased predictive distributions. OK, so uh, yeah, we've talked about assessing calibration, but maybe we want to assess calibration and sharpness simultaneously. And this is what scoring rules are for. So a scoring rule is a function of two arguments. The first argument is a probability distribution represented by its CDF. And the second argument is a real number, is the real valued outcome. Now, how should such scoring rules look like? Key requirement in a scoring rule is that it be proper. Now, a scoring rule is called proper if the following expectation inequality holds. And here we should take a closer look. Now we consider scoring rules to be negatively oriented, so the smaller, the better. You know, think of G like genuine, the real thing, and F like just any forecast or regression function. Here is the expected score or penalty if you if we issue you per prediction. G, and the outcome y indeed is distributed like G. Now, this 
expectation integral tells us, well, if we believe that the outcome is distributed like G, then we expect, when we expect its core is smallest under the true G, then under any other or false forecast F. And strict propriety holds if we have a more equality implies that F equals G. So this is what psychologists call a true theorem. Namely, under a proper scoring rule, truth telling is an optimal strategy in expectation. If S is proper, then we should be issuing our true belief, namely G in distributional regression, in distributional forecasting. Now, proper scoring rules have a really interesting mathematical theory. Characterization results relate closely to convex analysis. Adrian Rafter and I, we wrote, uh, we published a uh, review paper in Chaza in 2007, and uh, indeed uh, some of these results are, are classical and date back to the 1950s and 1960s, but let me refer to the earlier arti article on details. Now there is a single scoring rule that is very widely used in application communities. And this is the so-called continuous rent probability score, or CRPF. This is supposed to be an indicator function. Something went on with the file conversion, but you recognize that this is an indicator function. So, so the CRPS is the integral. Now this is the regression function for probabilistic forecast in form of a CDF. So F is going from zero at minus infinity to plus one at plus infinity. So this is the prediction. And this is an indicator function which jumps from zero to one in the outcome y. Or viewed differently, this is the CDF associated with the Dirac measure in the outcome. So we take the difference between the predictive CDF and the CDF of a Dirac measure in the outcome, take this difference, square it. We do so at every threshold value x, and then we integrate over real y. So this is the standard definition of a CRPS as originally proposed by psychologists, and actually, uh, yeah, this you can find in the two, aforementioned 2007 paper. Whenever f has a finite first moment, we can rewrite, we can get it, what is now called a kernel representation of the ERPS. And what is real nice, and this kernel representation tells us when f, forecast f itself is a Dirac measure, the second term vanishes, and this just becomes uh, the absolute error, so the CRPS generalizes the absolute error, and also, like the absolute error, it has a unit, namely the unit of the outcome. And for customary, when F, for example, is a normal distribution, this can be evaluated uh, yeah, in closed form, and actually closed form expressions are available for virtually all standard distributions in practice. And finally, when the outcome is binary or the Hyotamus, then the CRPS reduces to a classical prior score, which is simply the squared difference between the uh, predictive probability and the indicator of the uh, predicted event uh, occurring or not. Now, this is a slide uh, that I have to go through quickly, but the CRPS will be our preferred score. And what this shows here is that there are three equivalent representations of a CRPS as mixtures over elementary building blocks. And these elementary building blocks, so here we have a standard piecewise linear quantile score, which is using quantile regression. And here we have the so-called elementary scoring rules. Or Q 
by quantiles and for p for probability forecast of binary events. I cannot go into the details, uh, but I want to say here is the CRPS is very, uh, yeah, admits various representations in terms of simpler building blocks, details in a GRSSB discussion paper uh, by Van Ae Medal, 2016. Okay, finally, partial orders. You all know about partial order relations. A partial order has the same properties as the total order, reflexivity, anti-symmetry, and transitivity. So elements need not be comparable. They may be comparable, but they need not be comparable. And a key example is the component-wise order on RD. Of particular importance in our context are partial orders on the set P of a Borel probability measures on R, as always identified with the respective CDFs, and uh, sure you are familiar with the standard concepts of a stochastic order, which is exactly what, yeah, what everybody thinks it is. Uh, yeah, a variant is the increasing convex order, uh, which is in expressed in terms of expectations with respect to increasing convex functions of the underlying random variables. Also, we will need partial orders on RD. I mentioned the component wise order. Uh, yeah, but we will also consider the empirical stochastic order and the empirical increasing convex order. And these are orders induced by the stochastic order, as just discussed, on the associated empirical distributions of the, yeah, of the empirical distributions uh, simply that consist of the D values in a vector in RD. And here is a picture in R2. So here we have a point one, three, and the component wise order, the green points are smaller than the orange dot, and the blue values are bigger. And as you can see, the empirical stochastic and the empirical increasing convex order are uh, weaker than the component wise order in the sense that there are more points. Uh, that are smaller or bigger under these respective orders. And that can be very useful in IDR. So we are not necessarily using the component wise order. Uh, we are occasionally turning to empirical stochastic or empirical in, in convex order. Okay, uh, after this preparation, let's finally turn to IDR and begin with our definition and our key existence and universality theorems. So, so the basic context, concepts, uh, again, we work with training data, explanatory variables in some space X, vice by real-valued responses. Now, distributional regression generates a mapping from a covariate vector in this space, capital X, to a probability measure F sub X, which serves to model the conditional distribution of the outcome, even the covariate. Also, we need and want a partial order on this covariate space X. And the key concept in IDR now is that the mapping from X to F sub X is isotonic in the sense that if x is less than x prime in a given partial order, when f sub x is less than or equal to fx prime in the usual stochastic order on the space of overall probability measures. Now this formalizes this very basic idea that if we have a smaller covariate, then we have a smaller response. But we are concerned with distributional regression. So the notion of smaller is the stochastic order here in the space of uh, parallel probability measures. And it is just some given partial order in the covariate space. OK, so let's get formal here. If a covariate space equipped with a partial order, if training data covariate in X 
real values out, come we work with the stochastic order on the space P of a Borel probability measures, and we work with a given proper scoring rule S. With this, let's define isotonic S regression. And you notice there's a reference to the proper scoring rule S in the definition already. Now, an element F hat, this is an n tuple, n is the number of training data, an n tuple of Borel probability measures, is an isotonic S regression. If it is a minimizer of the empirical loss in terms of S, it's a loss when we issue F sub i, and y sub i is the outcome, a minimizer over, over, over all possible n tuples of distribution regression functions, subject to a condition where f sub i is stochastically smaller than f sub j, if x sub i is smaller than always or equal to, and I will not repeat this, x sub j, and this is true for all instances in the training set. So we adopt here the concept of empirical loss minimization. Uh, yeah, very basic concept. And we simply say that such a tuple is an isotonic S regression if it minimizes the empirical loss. Our first theorem, existence and uniqueness. If S is the CRPS, when there exists one and only one, a unique isotonic CRPS regression, and we call it F hat. And actually, we refer to this unique F as V isotonic distribution regression or IDR solution. Now, at first sight, this may appear, uh, well, oversold. We have one very specific proper scoring rule, S. We've proved that there exists a unique isotonic S regression for this specific S, namely the CRPS. And we call this V isotonic distributional regression solution. This, at this stage, this seems um, a little bit fishy because if we choose another proper scoring rule, S, it seems that we would get just another isotonic S regression. So there is a lot of, it seems, there is a lot of subjective choices here. But here comes the good news, the universality theorem. And the universality theorem tells us, well, no, this is, it is, it is very different. So this specific solution under the CRPS, well, first it is rational calibrate, which is a very nice property. And furthermore, it is an isotonic S regression, not only under the CRPS, but in fact, under any scoring rule, which is a mixture of elementary quantile scoring rules or a mixture of elementary probability scoring rules. For lack of time, I will not be able to prove this. Uh, let me refer to a, uh, yeah, to our paper, and again, in the paper, we refer to results and techniques in the aforementioned GRSSP discussion paper in the preprint by Alexander Jordan et al. But let me discuss the consequences. IDR is op optimal under just any proper scoring rule that depends on quantile or binary probability assessments only. And I really mean just any. And the methodological consequences that IDR subsumes excellent approaches to non-parametric isotonic regression in special cases, including but limited to quantile regression and binary regression. Uh, there is a sizable literature on non-parametric isotonic quantile regression and binary regression, and all this is a special case of our concept of S regression and CRPS regression. Okay, so now 
uh, that we have proved existence, uniqueness, and universality, how do we actually compute the IDR solution? It is by definition the solution to a constraint optimization problem in Pn, but this doesn't tell us how to compute it. Amazingly, universality and, well, classical theory, Gauss and Lechandre, the method of least squares, comes to rescue and gives us a, uh, actually, a, a really nice recipe how to compute the IDR solution. So by universality, we can refer to some specific choices. So maybe let's go back to these classes. So uh, we have universality with respect to mixtures of elementary quantile or probability scoring rules. And of course, we can plug in. So M and H here are locally finite Borel measures. We have universality under just any locally finite Borel measure. So we can, of course, pick any given one. And for example, we can pick this one to see that the IDR solution satisfies, yeah, can be written down as follows. And here this should be an indicator again. Uh, yeah, uh, something happened in the file conversion. And from this, yeah, we see that IDR can be, the IDR solution can be computed via a quadratic programming problem. See here we have a constraint, quadratic optimization problem, and we use the most advanced uh, quadratic solvers, namely the OSQP solver by Stellar Trade Al 2016 reference in our technical report. Also, the nice thing is the target function here is constant for set in between the unique values of the outcome in the training sample, and so we don't need to consider all sets along the real line. We only need to consider n points or n plus one points. So the overall computational cost is at least big O of n square, and we can tackle a problem with uh, established software. Finally, how do we use this for prediction? By construction, the IDR solution is defined at the training covariate values only. In practice, we need to make a prediction at a new covariate value. And this new covariate value, of course, typically is not one of the training covariate values. So what do we do? We look at the immediate predecessors and successors of this new covariate value among the ones in the training set. Now, this is the set of immediate predecessors defined in the obvious way, and this is the set of the immediate successors. Now, any predictive CDF that is consistent with the IDR solution must satisfy that, well, uh, yeah, the maximum of the FI heads and the successors, roads are turned around, is less than or equal to F of set, is less than or equal to the minimum over the predecessors, and this must be true at all threshold value set. So as long as these sets are non-empty, we choose the pointwise arithmetic average of the lower and the upper bound. And sometimes actually, uh, yeah, this is the unique choice, but in general, there would be other choices, but this is a reasonable choice and one that is easily implemented. Okay. Let us turn to a synthetic example, uh, which is the one from before. So we look at a training sample of size 600. Our covariate X was uniformly, is uniformly distributed on 0, 10. And the true conditional distribution is gamma with a certain shape and scale parameter that depends on X uh, in a way that uh, isotony is guaranteed. And here we see estimated conditional IDR uh, yeah, regression functions, and when x is equal to 0.5, then x 
equal to 3, 5, 7, and 9.5. And you see they're so associated with our respective x values uh, and yeah, the estimation seems to work. Work fine. Now let's turn to a training sample of size n equal to 10,000. We can still compute the IDR solution based on a full sample. Actually, here's for comparison with the theoretical regression functions. We see that, well, estimation is not perfect. Here it is much better. And actually, here we are using subpacking, subset aggregation, a very popular technique. That is, we estimate IDR on 100 subsamples of size 1,000 each, and then average over these 100 estimates. As you can see, we get a much better, a smoother estimate, and simultaneously, the subpacking approach <coughs> is superior in terms of computational costs. So IDR, the computational costs become prohibitive when the training samples get large, but when we can do subsample aggregation, to yield simultaneously better estimates and lower the computational costs. With this, let me uh, close with a case study from weather forecasting. And as you all are there, modern weather forecasts rely on numerical NWP models that represent the physical processes in the atmosphere. So, uh, yeah, everything works on a gridded representation of the atmosphere with physical processes are modeled here. And this is run operationally on supercomputers in real time with huge success. Nevertheless, major sources of forecast uncertainty remain. Let me just mention initial conditions, uncertain initial conditions, uncertain representation of sub grid scale processes, and so on. This has been addressed very nicely by the meteorological community via so-called ensemble simulations, a Monte Carlo approach. But despite the continuous improvement, there are still systematic deficiencies in the output from such NWP ensemble forecasts, and those are being addressed by statistical post-processing. So our case study is on the 52-member ensemble system. This is the world-leading weather prediction system operated by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, ECMWF. It consists of a high-resolution HRES member at 9-kilometer horizontal grid spacing. Here is an example of the uh, output field in terms of precipitation over Europe, a so-called control member at 18-kilometer grid spacing, and then there are 50 so-called perturbed member, uh, they start from perturbed initial conditions uh, based on those from the control run. Uh, they are also at a lower resolution of 18 kilometers, and they can be considered exchangeable, at least to a good degree of approximation. But still there are systematic deficiencies calling for statistical post-processing of your sample output via distributional regression. So our covariate vector is, well, is the 52, is at any given grid point, is a vector of the 52 point forecasts from your sample of NWP model. So again, we are concerned with precipitation. And actually, we are now simply looking, we are not looking at spatial maps, we are simply looking at weather stations at airports in London, Brussels, Zurich, and Frankfurt. We have 50, we have an ensemble forecast comprising 52 values, and of course, we have the respective outcomes, observations. We are looking at 24-hour accumulated precipitation, one to five days ahead, in a 10-year period, 2007 to 2017. Now, precipitation really is a challenging variable due to its non-negativity. And the 
takes this great continuous character. We have a point mass at zero, which corresponds to no precipitation at all. And then a continuous right skewed component on the positive half axis. So here we can perform an out of sample evaluation in comparison to distributional regression forecasts using the last two years available as test period, prior years served to provide training data, and generally IDR uses all available training data, whereas parametric competitors benefit from smaller rolling training periods. So again, the covariate vector, we are concerned with precipitation at a given point in space. So univariate variable, univariate outcome, and a 52 variate covariate vector comprising the respective values from the 52 members of a forecast ensemble. We compare IDR to the raw ensemble simply consisting of the empirical distribution of these 52 values and to state of the art parametric distribution regression techniques that have been developed specifically for this very purpose of precipitation forecasts. So OS is our acronym for the raw ensemble forecast, and we compare to the standard methods used by meteorological services, which is ISO Basin Model Averaging, BMA, or EMOS Ensemble Model Output statistics, based on uh, Bernoulli gamma mixtures or generalized left sense of generalized extreme value distribution, respectively. Now for IDR, we don't need to take any specific care to uh, cater for the mixed discrete continuous character of precipitation, nor do we need to do data transformations as in our approaches. So the only implementation decision that we need to take care of is to define a partial order on the elements of a covariate space, which is R52. And that partial order needs to reflect the fact that the elements, that these 50 guys here, are exchangeable. So, considering that these 50 components are exchangeable, we apply IDR in three variants. We apply IDR as the component wise order on R3, and R3 is simply this value, that value and the mean of the 50 exchangeable members. This is the most natural approach. Then the same thing, but combined with subset aggregation. This is IDR, subbagging, SBG. Finally, on the perturbed members, we do not need to reduce to the mean. We could instead use treat them as empirical distributions and apply the empirical increasing convex order on these 50 components, and this is IDR, ICX, increasing convex order. Yeah, here are respective formulas. Here is an example for Brussels forecast two days ahead for December 16, 2015. These are the 52 members of the raw ensemble forecast. As you can see, we all predict rain. A high resolution member predicts about seven millimeter. The mean of the 50 perturbed members is at about eight millimeter. The control forecast predicts about 14 millimeter. The parametric methods, BMA and EMOS, they generate smooth predictive distributions. Our IDR variants generate predictive distributions that are step functions. And actually, here is an illustration of how IDR operates. Yellow and blue represent the immediate predecessors and successors, respectively, and the IDR. So the gray area shows the possible 
values that the IDR predictive CDF can attain in this specific case. And as noted, we choose the arithmetic mean here in between. And sometimes, uh, yeah, there is no choice. And then uh, actually, yeah, of course, we, we, we take the only choice. And this results in the IDR predictive distributions. Here, it says calibration again. Um, yeah, this is assessed via PIT histograms. You forecast as U shaped PIT histograms, whereas all of a post processed forecast using various distributional regression methods, BMA, EMOS, the IDR variant. They generate uniform PIT histograms uh, at Brussels, Frankfurt, London, and Zurich. This is the CRPS for the methods at Brussels, Frankfurt, London, and Zurich. We see that we have the worst, the highest ERPS almost everywhere for the raw ensemble forecast. And one day ahead, yeah, the state of the art, EMOS wins. But then, as we turn to higher predictions of wins, sometimes IDR, which is a completely generic method, it's a completely general method performs better is not only on par, but sometimes even performs better, as we see here, than methods that have been specifically developed for a given purpose and are in operational use at level services worldwide. And this becomes even more pronounced, even at prediction horizon of one day ahead, IDR variants do better than the state of the art. And there's a simple reason for this. IDR is non-parametric. The prior score assesses forecasts of precipitation happening or not, simply of the event of precipitation. Here, non-parametric methods do not need to extrapolate. So they perform very well. Whereas, yeah, when you predict the amount of precipitation, this is was measured by the CRPS. Uh, yeah, their non parametric methods they cannot extrapolate, and so we are at a slight disadvantage relative to parametric methods like BMA and EMOS. But that is not the case when we are concerned with the occurrence of precipitation. Okay, so uh, let me close with a brief discussion. We are Witnessing a transition from conditional mean to conditional distribution estimation in regression analysis, which is prompted and accompanied by a transition from point forecasts to distributional probabilistic forecasts in general. We have introduced IDR, a powerful non parameter technique for estimating conditional distributions under order restrictions. IDR learns conditional distributions that are calibrated. And this is uh, what makes it worthwhile and attractive. Simultaneously, in sample optimal, relative to comprehensive classes of proper scoring rules. IDR was defined originally as CRPS regression, but it provides the optimal solution relative to very comprehensive classes of proper scoring rules. The method provides a unified treatment of all types of real-valued outcomes, dichotomous, discrete, continuous, etc. is entirely gener generic, fully automated, does not need any uh, yeah, implementation decisions other than the choice of a partial order. And there is code in our available uh, yeah, at the GitHub site of Alexander Hensi. So IDR might serve as an ideal benchmark technique in distributional regression and probabilistic forecast problems. Uh, it's an entirely generic method. Again, does not require subjective implementation decisions and nevertheless is strongly competitive. As a final thought, we all know about 
deep learning, and I'm sometimes I'm tempted to contrast IDR uh, with convolutional neural, net neural networks. Uh, IDR, in some sense, requires deep thinking uh, right at the beginning of the analysis, when a partial order needs to be chosen, when it's fully automatic which is quite a difference to using CNNs or other types of modern neural networks when you can just, well, throw it on your data, but when you really need to think about implementation decisions. So in, in this sense, uh, yeah, I think that uh, IDR and modern neural networks are partially overlapping, but largely complementary and uh, yeah, it really is application dependent uh, what may yield better results. And uh, yeah, with these thoughts, uh, I think it's, it's better to leave everything else uh, to personal discussion. And I look forward to talking to, to many of you later on. So many thanks for your attention.